You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 110, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, it's the end of April, beginning of May. Uh, it's, for many people, it's the start of gardening season, and a lot of people get thinking about soil this time of year. Is my soil good enough? What does it need? All that sort of stuff. And luckily today on this show, I've brought uh, author, master gardener, teacher, YouTuber, blogger, uh, and gardening mythbuster Robert Pavlis, uh, fresh off publishing a new book about uh, soil, here to educate us. His new book is called Soil Science for Gardeners, Working with Nature to Build Soil Health. Uh, Robert, uh, say hello and tell us, uh, tell us about your book. Why'd you write this book? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, well, I, I think soil is one of the most important things in gardening. In fact, uh, about six years ago, I was asked to create a, a general gardening course for the local university that was going to be used for the general public. And I sat down and thought, well, what are the topics I talk about? You know, trees and shrubs, perennials, grasses, and so on, and soils. And then I went to my library and pulled out some of the big books on gardening and found that they had almost nothing on soil. And I thought that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's all about the soil. So when I created my course, we actually spend the first night doing all soil, that's all we do. And uh, some people come into that part and they go, oh, this is probably gonna be pretty boring until they get into it. And then we start talking and afterwards they go, wow, I can't imagine how, I can't believe how exciting soil is all of a sudden. <laughs> But soil is so critical to plant growth, and it's really the only thing we can control. I mean, we, we control water a little bit, but most of that comes from the sky. Yes. Uh, light, we really can't control. I mean, we can put things under shade or in full sun, but... You choose whatever, a location, but... Whatever the sun is, that's what the sun is, right? The only thing we have some control over is the soil, and so it becomes yeah. vital. Yeah, especially well, even with even the water, because the you know your the composition of your soil can affect its ability to hang on to water, which we'll talk about later. Um, so yeah, it is like as a gardener, it is probably one of the most uh, amenable, uh, adjustable, optimizable aspects of your gardening enterprise. So it's very important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, and when does this book come out? It came out. Uh... Uh, about this time last year okay and the really great news is that it's actually sold out so they're in the second printing <laughs> okay good news for me uh, so i appreciate everyone buying it but it seems to have really hit a nerve and i think it's that combination of uh let's talk about soil in a in a bit of a technical way but write it for gardeners and so my books tend to be a little on the technical side, but I write them so that almost anyone can understand them. And that's really my goal with these books. And, and I, I, I think that's what's attracting people to the book. So. I have to say, I, so last year I had a guest on Keith Reed and he wrote a book. I can't remember what it's called now, but uh, I'll put it up on the screen. Soil something. <laughs> Sorry, Keith, I can't remember the name of your book. It was a fantastic book and I really enjoyed reading it. Oh, I should have had this thing out just to mention it. Um, anyway, I, I was concerned when I when I got this to read that there'd be a lot of overlap. And, you know, I mean, certain things you have, any book on soil has to discuss. Right. But I, I'm, and I probably read his book twice, right? I read it once and then I sort of I read the whole thing uh, just for the purpose of the interviews. And then I read the whole thing again, just I sort of had it in the bathroom next to the toilet sort of thing. So I just read it a second time just to get it all in my head, right? Just that's kind of how I, anything worth studying, I'll do that. Any good book, a knowledge book, I'll tend to do that because I'm kind of a captive audience. What are you going to do? Um, so uh, I'll probably do that with this one as well. Um, anyway, I'm really enjoyed reading. I'm not finished reading this. I'm on chapter six now. So I'm maybe what's that about a third of the way through, give or take. Um, but it's a very good read. It's, it's laid out really well. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, this is one of the most frustrating things I find this time of year is, you know, I live in a, a residential area and people, their idea of a garden, and I'm talking about a vegetable garden, seems to be make a wooden box, <laughs> buy 20 bags of black stuff from a store, put the bags of black stuff in the box, 
put the seeds in the black stuff. Yep. Right. And instant garden. <laughs> and then their garden sucks and they don't know what, because <laughs> they, I mean, sometimes that black stuff in the bag is good soil, I suppose, but sometimes it's just black stuff in a bag, almost like, uh, you know, they always say the fishing lures are designed to catch the fishermen, you know, like <laughs> get you to buy it and they, you know, that one looks good and you buy it in the store. It's, it's, it's not shiny for the fish. It's shiny for you. Right. Um, so yeah, this is like, if there's one thing people need to increase, if you know more about soil, understand it a lot better, you will be a good, better gardener. It's just, it's all going to flow from that. Almost like in a martial arts, they're always like, you know, control your breathing and your balance, you know, and then everything else sort of comes from there. Right. Um, it's because it's sort of like the base of everything else. Uh, so I've been working my way through this and uh, I thought I would have some, I got a bunch of questions for Robert. I'm going to ask them on you, the viewer's behalf. Uh, some of them are, the first few are kind of general questions that just get you into uh, Robert's head, where he's coming from um, in writing this book and the major concepts he's employing. And then the later ones are, are, are fairly uh, uh, technical questions that just things that uh, piqued my interest as just things that came to mind as I was reading the book. Oh, I wonder what about this? Things I wanted to ask him immediately when I was reading it. Uh, but, you know, I couldn't because... Well, You're only John. I was in the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, I might be one of the only people who has a pencil holder in the bathroom. Uh, I'm either doing that or Sudoku or whatever. Um, anyway, so question number one. Uh, simple question, probably not the most simple of answers, but what is soil? Well, it, it's, of course, a very basic question, and it's not a big surprise to people. They know it has sand, silt, and clay in it. Uh, it also has some organic matter in it and some water, right? We all know that. What I think is a big surprise to people is that if we're talking about good soil now, 25% of that soil is air. Okay, so one quarter of it is air. And I think most people wouldn't even include it on the list of things that make up soil. You, you mean by volume, right? By, by volume, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the water and air is half of your soil, okay? It's huge. And I think most of us would think, well, how, you know, 90% of it has to be that black stuff that I'm walking on, but it's not, it's air and water. The other thing that we talk a lot about is the level of organic matter in soil. And organic matter is absolutely critical. And it's, it's one of the things that you know, we talk about in the book over and over again in, in different ways. But we think that, Jesus, soil must have a lot of organic matter to be good soil. But ideal soil only has about 5% organic matter. Now that, that's by weight, 10% uh, by volume, because organic matter tends to be light. Um, and that's ideal soil, okay? And that's ideal soil that has a reasonable amount of clay in it. If you have sandy soil and you have 1% organic matter, you're actually doing fairly well because you, you can't get the organic matter up past about two, two and a half percent in sandy soil. Why is that? So it, uh, it just de uh, degrades too fast. The sand doesn't really hold on to organic matter whereas clay will essentially protect that organic matter from decomposition. I see. So getting a high level is, is not really that critical. We're only talking a few percents organic matter, but the difference between you know, 4% and 5% is huge in a garden, right? So it is a small amount. And there is a myth out there that says, you know, the more organic matter we can put in, the better. That's not necessarily true. And you can have too much organic matter. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, you want a reasonable amount, but you don't want too much. Right, and why is that? Well, if you have too much, then you have to remember organic matter is not stable. So it's constantly decomposing, it's constantly being eaten by microbes. And it's actually the microbe food. So you put a lot of this in there, you suddenly grow a lot of microbes, but they don't live very long. They die, they add more organic matter. And that whole process adds lots of nutrients. So the nutrient level actually goes up as you add organic matter and it can become toxic. I see. 
So you mentioned these boxes that people are building, these raised beds. And there, there are many cases of people who build those and they put you know, like 50% compost in there or manure. And then a couple of years later, they can't grow anything because there's so many nutrients in there, they're killing their plants. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so you can have too much organic matter, right? So my rule of thumb is, is add about an inch every year on your soil and that's lots. Right. Now, if you're starting a new garden, you might add more depending on how bad your soil is to start with. But on a yearly basis, don't add huge amounts. You just want a little bit added constantly. Every year, a little bit of organic matter. And then you won't have this issue of a toxic garden. Uh, what is soil health? What is it? What is meant when we use that term? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a squishy term. But I, I think the way to look at it is that a healthy soil has a high population of living organisms and it's, it's everything. It's, you know, it's mice, it's plants, it's microbes, it's bacteria, it's fungi, all those things that live in soil. And by the way, there, there are more species in soil than there are anywhere else in the world. We just don't see them. You know, we can name a few of them in general terms, but we really don't understand what's in soil. But the more life that's in soil, the healthier it becomes. And largely because these things are continually being cycled around, right? There's life, there's death, things die, they decompose, the decomposition releases nutrients, other things come along and use those nutrients, one of which is plants. But a lot of the other things that are living there also use those nutrients. You know, earthworms come along and they eat some organic matter, They're, they need those nutrients. Bacteria can't live without those nutrients. So the more life we get in there, the healthier that soil is. And what we do know is that when soil has a lot of things living in it, plants grow better. Those two go hand in hand. When that soil life comes down, plants suffer. Right. Right. So those two are very closely tied. So as gardeners, what we're really doing is farming microbes and earthworms and insects. And, yes. and if we create those, the plants come along on their own. We don't have to worry about the plants. Right. But if we don't do that in soil, we have trouble growing plants. Right? Yes. And then we have to do all kinds of silly things like buying commercial fertilizer and, and all kinds of stuff to, to make those plants grow big enough. Yeah, yeah. But if we take care of the, the ecosystem in the soil, all those living things, uh, the plants are automatic. In fact, then our problem is they grow too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're, you know, in, in essence, you're saying that uh, the healthy soil is soil that supports uh, a broad range of living things uh, existing in it, right? Yeah. Like it's an ecosystem. It, it uh, is very much an ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's that makes sense to me. Um, now, I guess it follows from that question, because people say this a lot, the soil is a living thing, the soil is alive. And I know you're a scientist, so you probably have a problem with that statement. So yes, is the soil alive? Uh, no, it isn't. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, it, this is perhaps a bit of a personal beef I have, but you know, all these terms in science have definitions. And if you yes. go and look at the definition of soil, it does not include any of the living organisms. Yeah. It's dead organic matter, that humus stuff. It's sand, silt, and clay, and water, and air, and that's it. There are no living organisms in the definition of soil. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, the problem is a lot of people say soil is living, and as soon as soil is living, they treat it like a living organism and come up with all kinds of stupid things they should do to the soil. And, yes. and that's why I'm against that term. It's, it's not a huge thing. Now, there is something called the soil ecosystem, yes. okay? the soil environment, and that certainly exists. So now we're looking at everything we walk on, anything that's under there, including all the living organisms, the plants and everything else. And there is certainly an ecosystem like that, but the soil itself 
isn't living. The, uh, the analogy here I use is, is this. Uh, we know that in the air that we're breathing, we're walking around and the dog ran across the air and the air is full of uh, fungi spores and bacteria and everything else all floating around in the air. But nobody goes around talking about air as being living, right? It's, it's, it's dead stuff and there's these living organisms in it. In it. Right? And soil is exactly the same thing. The actual soil part is, is dead and stuff lives in soil, right? right? So we're not never feeding soil. We, we might feed the organisms that are living there, but we're not feeding soil. Yeah, I think it's, I think it, it, it's, it's very possible that, that some gardening protagonists or gurus, perhaps they use it as a shorthand. They'll say, feed the soil, the soil's alive. And they're, they're just, they're, they're using that as a shorthand or maybe as a metaphor um, but, uh, I try in my videos to say, feed the organisms in the soil, yeah. right? That's sort of the soil system, Try right? To use that language. And of course it adds words and makes things sound more complicated. We're always trying to simplify. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's the organisms in the soil, all of them that you're feeding. And then they're, they're something's going in one end, something's coming out the other end. And, uh, and the plants are benefiting from that whole process, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, another topic. Uh, another key thing, you have a really good chapter, I think it was a chapter here, if it's not a chapter, it's a good section about water. Um, I really enjoyed reading it, it very thought provoking. This is something you don't think about a lot. Um, so, and you, you, you got, you know, you, you got, you're a, you're a chemist, you have a background of a chemist and you spoke, you wrote like a chemist in the section. And to whatever is possible to make that work in this, uh, in this conversation, um, it's hard for me to dumb down because I don't have your background, but I found it probably one of the best explanations about water particles, soil particles, how they hang on to each other. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe you could just talk a little bit around how does water move through soil? How does soil hang on to water? What does all that mean? It's very important to understand for a gardener. The, the interesting thing about water is that it's a very unique molecule. And if, if we look at it, we, we know it's H2O, but that's kind of a simple way to look at it. Water is actually a three-dimensional molecule that is kind of like a little magnet. So one end is positive and the other end is negative. Okay. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but it's absolutely critical to everything that goes on on Earth. So when we take some salt and put it in our in a cup of water that salt breaks up into two ions one happens to be positive one happens to be negative and the reason that happens is because the water itself is like a little magnet it's got this positive end this negative end if water didn't do that if water was neutral then things like salt and so on wouldn't dissolve in water and quite honestly nothing would grow in soil because it couldn't pick up the salt it's like the whole the whole biochemistry, everything that goes on on Earth would have to be completely different. Hmm. The, the chemistry of that water molecule is, is absolutely critical this, to this process. When we look at what happens in soil, we also find places that have charges. So the water is charged and particularly the clay and the organic matter are also charged things like sand and silt are not. And if you understand that difference, then a lot of things in soil make a lot of sense. So for instance, if I have sandy soil and I put in these nutrients and all the nutrients are salts, just like our table salts. So the nitrates and the phosphates and the ammonium, they're all salts really. They stick to clay because they're charged. So the clay is charged, it's like a little magnets all these salts are charged, they stick to the clay. And that's why clay soil is very nutritious because it actually holds on to these things. Uh, organic matter is also charged. So organic matter and humus also holds on to all these things. Sand and silt doesn't. Sand and silt have no charges. So when we put fertilizer on a sandy soil, and then we water it, the water just washes it right through. The nutrients stick with, to the water and move with the water while the pores are so big in sand, it just water just runs through it. So 
the nutrients are lost. Whereas if I take that same fertilizer and put it on clay soil, it sticks to the clay. It doesn't go anywhere. Right. And clay and organic matter both have those properties. And that's actually one of the really important values of organic matter. Organic matter holds on to those nutrients, especially in sandy soil. Right. We have sandy soil with no organic matter. It doesn't hold on to anything. And if it doesn't hold on to these nutrients, plant roots can't get nutrients. So the interesting thing is that plant roots are able to pull off these nutrients off the clay particles and out of the water. But the whole thing only works because water is able to come along and these charged particles, these salts, go into the water and attach to the water, move along with the water until it gets to the root. And then it moves from the water into the root. Okay, So the, that simple charged molecule, that water, is really what allows the fertilizer to get to the roots. Right. And when I'm talking about fertilizer, I'm talking in general here that, you know, if you use an organic material, a fish emulsion, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, your compost pile, they're all producing these salts and they're all moving through the soil with the water. Right. Okay. And so that's how the whole thing works. So it's, it becomes really critical. It also explains why having a little more organic matter is so useful in soil, right? Because it holds onto the nutrients and right. makes them available to plants. Well, and I guess it, it shows that it, it, there's a certain amount of plants, a minimum amount that plants need. Yeah. And you're, what would you say, 5% uh, organic matter, what, you know, um, that's, uh, I guess, for a 5% organic matter that ensures to some extent that that minimum amount of not only water, but the nutrients that are dissolved in the water are there. Um, that's right. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, that's so, right. yeah, what the main thing I took away from this was th to think about the nutrients as magnets and the water as magnets. And the clay and the organic matter are magnets that hold on to the water and the nutrient magnets. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? So if, if you've got the right, you know, a reasonably good composition of your soil, which you can amend, mm -hmm. um, then you're going to have what you need. You're not going to have to keep adding these things. It's going to hang on to it. And that, I guess, another side, side question is uh, one of the most common points people make when they ask me questions is they'll say, my soil is clay. Right. And they always talk about that like it's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, and my soil is just clay. My soil literally is clay and rocks. It's uh, what Keith Reed called builder's loam, right? It's the stuff they use to make houses on because it's so damn hard. Um, and uh, sure, I had to, you know, when I initially established the garden, I worked some horse manure into it and some stuff like that. And I, I keep it mulched. So there's always organic matter being added. But the base uh, there is mostly clay. It's more clay than anything else. And I mean, anyone watching my gardening tours, I've, I get good results every year and I don't, I don't add fertilizers. I mean, I, the clay, I think, is an advantage. It hangs on to the nutrients. It hangs on to the water. I mean, you know, sure, you can't have like concrete, you know, clay to the point where it's concrete. Um, but yeah, what would you say to the gardeners that, I mean, I, I can only say it so many different ways, but, you know, is, is clay a problem or is it, you know, is it, is it well, a Clay, clay can be a problem, um, but no clay can be a worse problem, okay? So if, if you're gardening with no clay and you have sand and silt, you got a real problem that's really hard to fix. Now, you can dig in that soil really easily. So you might feel good when you dig and you can plant things really easily. On the right. other side of the street, you've got the guy with heavy clay, and the problem with heavy clay is it's really hard to dig in, right? So the minute you go out there with a shovel, you push it in, you go, oh, God, I got awful soil. Okay. Well, that's sort of true. It's hard to dig in, but the soil isn't awful. The soil is actually pretty good. You, you have a better starting point than the guy with sand. The trick now is how do we loosen up that clay? Yeah. Right? And... Um, my first garden was really heavy clay. I, I wish I'd measured it because if I took a shovel full of the soil and, you know, threw it over, it just sat there as one big lump. 
right? It, it, I actually had to chop it apart to make it smaller pieces. Yes. But it grew stuff. So the trick now is, is we got to loosen this up. And clay has two problems. One is it compacts really easily. So we have to overcome compaction. Whereas sand doesn't have that problem. It's really hard to compact sand. But clay compacts really well. And particularly in new subdivisions, everyone's clay is completely destroyed because of compaction. The second problem is that the builders have come along and taken the topsoil away and left you with the subsoil, which is the clay, but there's no organic matter in there. So we have good soil, which is the clay, but it's compacted and has no organic matter. If we add those two things back into the clay soil, we end up with good soil. Right? Yeah. That's not an easy, fast process though, right? So if I had to choose between sand and clay, I'd rather have the clay because it's relatively easy to fix that. Sand, you'll never fix. You're, you're gonna add organic matter to that over and over and over again, and it just disappears. It just sucks yeah. away, right? Whereas clay soil, over time, you can turn it into a good garden soil. This is a, you know, uh, an issue that I've been meaning to make a video about. Um, you know, there, there's a very popular gardening video out there called the Back to Eden Gardening Film. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the key protagonist in that film is a documentary and you've got this guy, Paul Gauchy, with an amazing garden. Everything looks great. And he's telling you what he did to have his garden. And he's telling you what to do to have a great garden. And he just says, just cover everything with the mulch and everything's going to be great. And, you know, I'm sure eventually that's the case. And of course, this guy's in like zones, zone nine or zone eight, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Not, not where, where basically things, uh, you know, if you have a mulch on a soil, it can continue breaking down in the winter. Right. Uh, here where I live, nothing's breaking down in the winter. Everything's just in suspended, suspended animation sort of thing, right? Yeah. Um, so I've told people, you know, if I, if I was establishing a garden that you got nothing there, right? Um, especially if it was like that builder's lawn, that clay and rock and just nothing there. It's ba basically been wrecked, right? It's been dumped off a dump truck and it's, it's been used because you can pack it down and it won't move after a, you know, giant tank bulldozer things driven over it. And it, you know, it, it, it really aggregates and it holds in place. Uh, I would say throw a bunch of manure in it, till the whole thing. And, and, and people are shocked because I'm a no-till gardener. I never till my garden. I'm, I'm talking about year one, step one. Because sure, you could you could mulch that and leave a mulch on it, and over time the worms and stuff will work it through, and eventually. But it could take years for that to happen. Um, whereas, I mean, the main thing is you want to get some of that OM organic matter into the soil, and so yeah, sure, till it in the first year. You're gonna just you're gonna take years off of that process, you know, and then then be a purist, you know. But uh, <laughs> well, what I what I, I agree with you, and and I tell people is the first year if you have crappy soil, you you might as well till it. Because, see, the reason we're no-till gardeners is that we know tilling can harm the soil. But if you're starting with crap, it's already wrecked. <laughs> you're not going to harm it. No. It can only go up from there. So, it, and, that, and the first year tilling it and getting organic matter in there is, is critical. There are people who are very strong proponents of using wood chips, and, and I am too. And they'll tell you things like, oh, you put wood chips on there, you know, two years later, you've got this great soil. That's baloney. Uh, I, 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 have I agree. Pretty, I have clay soil, but it's pretty good. And I've been here 15 years and I can dig down in the top three or four inches. It's actually pretty good in my perennial garden now. But if I dig below that, it's just as crappy as it was 15 years ago because I'm not digging in that soil. See, the vegetable yeah. garden's a little different because it tends to get, you know, moved around a little more. You're doing a little more digging and harvesting every year and so on. But in gardens where it's just sitting, putting mulch on top, it works, but it's a really slow process. And I don't know how people say in two years, you're going to see a big change. It, it's not going to happen. Now, two years later, yeah, it's better than it was when you started, but you got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, maybe after two years, you've got, uh, a centimeter of, of black, you know, uh, compost between the, the mulch layer and the clay layer. And to some extent, the clay is, is holding on to some of the nutrients that are re resulting from that breaking down. Yeah. Um, but 
I mean, yeah. I still believe in the wood chips, but I think the the advantage for improving soil is highly overrated by some people. Yeah, it's, it's good for maintaining. If you have good soil, especially in a perennial garden where you're not, you know, with potatoes, it's like I've grown potatoes in wood chip mulch gardens and you don't want to work them wood chips into the garden. So when you got to harvest the potatoes, you got to move the wood chips aside, get the yeah. potatoes out, then put the wood chips back. You don't want to be working all these wood chips into the soil because um, then you, you're probably going to have a nitrogen drop for a year or two while the, while the, or, you know, the organisms work that all out. But uh, yeah. You know, getting way off topic here, <laughs> but it's all you know. It's, it's all the stuff that you think about when you think about soil. Because you, hey, this guy said this, this guy said that. Where's what's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, I think you're yeah. To, to some extent, your um, your climate matters too. If everything's oh. frozen solid, yeah. We we you and I are in basically the same climates, and six months of the year is a write off as far as Ice. things <laughs> decomposing, right? Yeah, it's just frozen solid. So. Uh, sure, in a warm climate, I'm sure it goes much faster. I think wood chips are a better, like in terms of like building soil, I think they're probably work better in a hotter place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's probably also advantages in a hotter place. They probably regulate the soil temperature better in the summer. Yeah. Um, whereas here in Canada, like you want to have like, like I like to use hay and grass. I like to use like fast, fast breaking down stuff uh, yeah. just to get some heat happening because you know, I need anything to get some heat happening, especially this time of year where it's, you know, below freezing every night, um, or almost every night, it's still, you know, we all have the odd warm day, but it was, I don't know, it was snowing a couple of days ago, it's still yeah. cold, right? So we'll do any, just to get the spring going, we'll do anything to get some kind of heat happening. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, next question, I guess this flows from the last question to some extent. Um, uh, what are aggregate, this is a term I hadn't heard before. So, mm. um, so it got me thinking. Uh, what are aggregates and what are binding agents in soil? Yeah, so aggregates is, is one of those terms that the soil people know really well, but for some reason, gardeners never use the word, right? We talk about fluffy soil and black soil, and or, but we don't call them aggregates. And I like the term aggregates because I think it, it kind of describes what happens. So as soil gets better, the small pieces of soil, the sand and silt and clay, they start clumping together into larger and larger particles. And I recommend that all gardeners go for a walk in the woods. Like it doesn't have to be a woods, it could be a, like a, a prairie meadow that's been there forever, but find some place that hasn't been disturbed for 30 years. Go for a walk and dig around in the soil. In a wooded area, you can probably do that with your hand. You don't even need a trowel. And just feel the difference between that soil and what you have back in your garden. And I have a, a natural wooded area. It's a sugar bush. And that soil is, is crumbly. And there's these larger particles in there. And you, I can almost dig it with my hand. Yep. Uh, that's aggregation. So what happens is that these small particles along with some organic matter and humus and some binding agents all come together and to make these big clumps. What, when you say clump, what do you, what, like, what, well, what's, they, what size of thing are you talking about? Uh, well, they can be as, uh, uh, as large enough to sit in your palm of your hand. Right. So if you go into, into good soil and you sort of dig around, you, you can actually take a, a good clump of soil and you'll see all the pieces in there. You'll see roots in there and, and uh, old plant matter and so on. But most of the time they're smaller. They're, they're sort of a couple of millimeters across, okay? But they're visible to the eye. Whereas, you know, things like silt and clay particles are not visible to the eye. So we do want them larger. And as they get larger, what happens is that we have these large pieces and now there's lots of air spaces between them, okay? And that's really the secret. As long as our soil has small particles, they, they gather together and there's very little air in there. As you get aggregation, you get more and more air because you've got these big pieces. And remember 25% of good soil is air, so it's gotta stay somewhere. The other thing that happens is that Roots are not very good at drilling into small pores. They need pretty big pores. 
In fact, one of the things they do is if, if a dewworm makes makes a channel somewhere, the roots will actually follow that channel because it's the easiest place to grow. And as we get these aggregates, the particles are big. So these are particles are bigger than a grain of sand, right? And now the roots have an easy time going between the aggregates. So suddenly roots have no problem growing and finding lots of air in this soil. All right. But the opposite is no aggregates and compacted soil. And in that we have, we have no air, we have no spaces for the roots to grow and things just don't live in there. But even microbes have trouble living in compacted soil. So as these aggregates develop, we're in effect creating the perfect place for microbes to grow and for plant roots to grow. Right. So the whole process of building soil is, is to increase the amount of aggregation you have. Okay. And one of the things in the, probably, you haven't probably gotten to this part in the book, but in the sec second section of the book, it talks about tests that you can do to evaluate your soil. And one of them is aggregate stability. So what you do is you take one of these aggregates and you put it in a, a little mesh uh, um, piece of metal, like a chicken wire thing, and you settle it in water and see what happens. Good aggregation will sit there. It doesn't fall apart. Bad ag aggregation, it just crumbles and falls through. Right, right, right. But good aggregation, all these things are clumped together fairly strongly and the water forces that are rushing in there can't break them apart. So it's a very, it, I can't say it's very stable, but it, it, it's fairly stable in the soil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you can actually measure it yourself by doing that, that uh, aggregation test to see how stable your aggregates are. Um, but it's all about aggregation. So making healthy soil is all about making aggregation. So you have to ask the question, well, what makes aggregation, right? Well, it's, it's microbe poop, it's okay. microbe juice, it's worm <laughs> juice, it's, it's all the excrements that these things are giving off that stick this together. And some of the things they give off last a fair amount of time. So they're kind of a glue, it's an organic glue that they're giving off. And if, if all the life died, that glue would stick around for a while, but over time, that glue slowly decomposes and degrades and you lose the aggregation. Right. So what it means is you constantly have to keep the life in the soil to re-aggregate, I guess, to, to keep making more of this sticky stuff, right? right. So Again, it's that life in the soil that makes the sticky stuff that makes your aggregation and the aggregates is what plants love to grow in. Right? And it really yeah. is a, an extraordinary example of a symbiosis, you know, just, just even in, in terms of the relationship between the organisms and the soil. If in order for the soil to be an ideal environment for them, they need to be doing their thing to, to maintain the, uh, Know, the, the bind to, pr to provide the binding agents that allow the aggregation that allows the soil to do what soil does to support the life that grows and to keep the whole thing going yeah i i mean when i when i wrote the book it it wasn't as clear to me when i started as when i finished but it's amazing how all this kind of comes together and how all these organisms influence the other organisms and make their life easier but it's very cyclical right? It, yes. it, it all comes back down to helping themselves. And, um, and in the process, plants can live because plants can't do much on their own. They're, they're not as good as some, some of these other things to, to condition that soil. So they're kind of waiting for these other things to condition the soil for them so that they can grow. Right? Well, yeah, and I, it speaks to, I mean, this was, you know, probably, I'm going to mention it now because I'm going to forget about it as we go along. But I mean, you know, a lot about, it seems to me, a lot about having healthy soil and a successful, relatively low maintenance garden is to, to, to mimic natural systems as much as possible mm -hmm. uh, in a, because a garden is not a natural system, at least in terms of an, in terms of annuals, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not like a forest where there's leaves falling down. It, it's remulching itself every year automatically. The one thing it's missing from your garden is that it's, it's artificial in the sense that it's, if you don't provide the, 
the fuel for that system, you know, some you know, critical amount of minimal amount of, of mulch to keep the soil covered to feed the soil life. Um, it's just not going to get what it needs. Um, so that, that, that's, that's your, your main, you know, aside from, I guess, giving it water if it needs it and that sort of thing, one of your, one of your main responsibilities as a gardener is to fill in the gaps that are, because you have a slightly artificial situation, mm -hmm. and you've got tomatoes growing in Canada, <laughs> you know, and it, you're making a tomato forest, you're making a carrot forest, you're making a, you know, these things aren't natural, these things don't exist, uh, I don't think they exist naturally in nature like that. Um, so you have to, you're solving problems that are, are, are the result of your sort of artificial growing system by, you know, bringing in something, and in, in the case of my garden, that would be mulches. Yeah. Well, if, if we think about a natural system, right, that, that soil is completely covered with weeds in, in effect, right? Whereas in yeah. our gardens, we, we have that tomato in the middle and we get rid of all the weeds. So the amount of plant growth is, is largely reduced. And those roots, as they die, are adding organic matter to the soil, right? So we're missing that. And you're right. That's why we have to bring a bit back every year to kind of replace what, what we're destroying. But the key is to understand the natural system and then figure out, well, how can we do the least amount of work to make this other system, our garden actually function, right? Yes. And the more we mimic nature, the easier it becomes. We, we gotta let nature do all of this stuff. That's why I'm not a big fan of uh, the way we started this, this program, right? Go out and buy bags of soil and pop them in a box and we got a garden. Um, I, I'm sure if you buy the right soil that, that works, but you've sort of uh, short circuited the whole process. And if you don't understand the soil and what you did, you're gonna have problems down the road because you're not making that better and better every year. That's right. Well, and you've missed the opportunity to, to learn about it. It's almost like buying a musical album and thinking you're a musician. Yeah. Uh, you know, buying an, you know, buying a, an album thing. Hey, I'm a great musician because I can press play and this thing sounds great. It's like, no, you haven't learned anything about music. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess going, going on with that. Um, this is something I hadn't really thought about that was brought up in your book. Um, the fact that most of the nitrogen in the soil is actually not plant available. So perhaps you should start with mm. defining what you mean by plant available nitrogen. Yeah. Um, but then ex explain what, I, I didn't know that. So I think you had a number in there, like 3% of the nitrogen, something like that, of the, of the nitrogen mm -hmm. in the soil. Uh, only 3% of this nitrogen in the soil is actually usable by the plants. The rest is, is there, but the plants can't use it. Can you explain that a little bit? I, I better read the book, see, see if that 3% is right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know what the number is, but it, it is a small number, right? So nitrogen is available in sort of three main forms. Um, we have things like nitrate and ammonium, and both of those are salts. These are these things that plants can use as food. So they can absorb ammonium and they can absorb nitrate. And a lot of our synthetic fertilizer has one or both of those in it. There's also some called nitrite, which is a little different than nitrate. Um, microbes and particularly bacteria can easily convert the nitrate to nitrate. So we can kind of ignore that one. The third way is what we call organic nitrogen. So our bodies need nitrogen as well. And we get a lot of our nitrogen from protein. So we eat protein. That protein has a fair amount of nitrogen in it. If I remember right, but don't quote me, it's somewhere around 14% nitrogen. Okay. And that's where we get our nitrogen source. But we have a digestive system that is able to take that protein and digest it and use it. Plants don't have that. So m almost all the nitrogen they get is from this nitrate and ammonia. So if I take a piece of meat and put it in the soil, it's got lots of nitrogen, but plants simply can't use it. If I look at the compost we make, we, we say that's finished compost and it's nice and black, but almost all the nitrogen in there is still organic nitrogen. 
Hmm. Now, it could be in the form of protein molecules. It could be in the form of amino acids, but they're larger molecules. It's not in the form of nitrates yet. And until it becomes nitrates, plants can't use it. Now, that's not 100% true. So the most recent research is showing that plants can actually use amino acids, hmm. not proteins, because proteins are huge molecules, but amino acids, they can use them. What's not clear yet is how much of the nitrogen they actually get from amino acids. Uh, mo it seems as if the, the bacteria are much better at eating amino acids than plants. And so it seems as if most of that nitrogen in amino acids is used by microbes, not by plants. We know that the majority of nitrogen in plants comes from nitrate and ammonia. I just want to stop you for a second because I know of the way a lot of uh, listeners might think. When you say ammonia, they're going to say, oh, but that's a chemical. Um, so can you explain how ammonia exists in nature? <laughs> so this is one of the biggest myths about organic gardening and the whole concept of the being organic, okay? People believe that there is organic nitrogen that plants can use and there's inorganic or synthetic nitrogen that plants can use. And that's simply not true. The nitrogen that plants use is identical no matter where it comes from. So if you put manure in your garden, until that manure becomes nitrate or ammonium, plants can't use it. Synthetic fertilizer has nitrate and ammonium in it, and plants can use it. They're identical. Okay? There is no such thing as organic nitrates or organic ammonium. Okay? There is such a thing as organic nitrogen, but we're talking about these big protein molecules, which plants can't use. So by the time that plants can use the nitrogen, it's all synthetic, it's all inorganic, it's all nitrates. And this idea that one is a better source than the other because it's organic is, is complete nonsense. And what I find really surprising is that you know, in today's world, we, we have some new concepts in science, you know, global warming and the effect of CO2 and so on. We can maybe still discuss some of those things because we're still learning about it. But this business of the nitrate, we knew this 200 years ago. Okay? The scientists haven't been debating this for 200 years. Right. <laughs> but organic gardeners are debating it and don't believe it. Right. This isn't new science. This is old, old stuff. So that statement is absolutely correct. There, from a plant's perspective, there is no difference between an organic source and a synthetic source as far as the nutrients go. And you can have a ammonia can turn into, sorry, uh, like a, let's say I put some cow manure in my soil. That can be converted into ammonia? Yes. And, that, just, and that's basically what basically just like crapped out of a fungi or a bacteria or something like that. Well, it's, that's what happens during decomposition, right? In your yeah. compost pile. So what we put into a compost pile is, you know, is an orange. Well, if we, if we go down and look at the molecules in that orange, they're big molecules. They're, they're large proteins. They're large uh, uh, molecules that make the cells. They're large sugars and starches. They're all these large molecules in that orange. Completely useless to plants. They can't use any of it. And so what happens is various types of organisms come along. And a lot of them is fungi and then bacteria. And they slowly decompose these big molecules. And they're, they're basically eating them up and they're digesting them. And that process continues until everything is broken down into very basic nutrients, nitrates, phosphates, ammonia. Then plants can use it. Right. So that decomposition process is what happens in a compost pile and it's continually happening in the soil. In fact, if you think about it, you know, when I put an orange in the ground and a fungi comes along and, and degrades that, the fungi actually grows and, and it has babies and it gets more, but at some point that fungi dies. But the fungi is also big molecules, right? So 
now the fungi has to decompose and it slowly starts decompose it, decomposing, but in order to decompose, that has to happen with other organisms, other microbes. And those microbes are growing. So they're decomposing this stuff, but at the same time growing and building more proteins, more big molecules. So it's a continuous cycle of these molecules becoming smaller and becoming larger and becoming smaller and becoming larger. And at some point, the plant root comes along and says, oh, I'm gonna grab a nitrate molecule while it's handy, because if I don't, some bacteria is gonna take it away and grow and right. make protein out of it, All right? So plants only get kind of the leftover juices that other things don't use up quicker. Right. <laughs> um, but this process is continually going on. So the nitrate and ammonium are really the only sources. Now, the other thing that is important to understand is that these are very solid bone water. Remember, we started the program with the water magnets. Okay, nitrates and ammonia are little magnets. One's positive, one's negative, and they stick on the water. So when it rains, water flows through the soil. And if we get a lot of water, it, it rushes through the soil and comes out the bottom, but it takes those nitrates and ammonium with it, right? Because they hold on to those things, those are little magnets. So at any given time, there's only a small amount of nitrate floating around the plant roots. Some of it's yes. being turned into larger molecules and, and organisms, and some of it's being washed away by the water. So the total amount at any given time is quite low. And it turns out that the nutrient that's most limiting for plant growth is nitrogen, right? right. All of the other things in, in the average soil or in most gardens, there's, there's enough for the plants to survive, but nitrogen is the rate limiting nutrient. It's the thing that prevents plants from growing. Right. right. So if we're gonna add anything to soil, we have to add some nitrogen because that's the thing that's most likely missing. Well, and your, your point, I remember reading this in the book about how, like, so let's say you, you go and your plants aren't looking good. So you, you go and throw some just, you know. 10, well, 10, 10. <laughs> yeah, so throw something like that on your garden. And then there's a huge rain and you know, so your, your roots grab a little bit as it goes, you know, goes down through the soil or just washes right off the surface. And perhaps some of the soil particles hangs on to some of that. Um, but it made me think of when I first started getting into, you know, really seriously reading, you know, because, so I was always into gardening, but I wasn't a voracious reader and really trying to understand it, right? Mm -hmm. um, my curiosity got going. And I was exploring the different types of manure, horse manure. And you know, because horse manure was what I had available for free. So now I, I found one of these uh, agricultural extensions where it talks about all the different manures. And I had really good results in my garden. Everything was growing well. And I read on these uh, agricultural extensions that horse manure is like the weakest manure there is in terms of you know, available, plant available nutrients. I was like, well, how is that the case? Right. But I came to understand that just like you're saying your, your soil with the organic matter in it. Sure, it, it doesn't have a lot, but it has enough. And it's, 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 it's got a lot of breaking down left to do, right? It's, it's, it goes right through the horse, right? Very little, the horse gets very little out of the food it eats. So there's all this organic matter still in that horse poop and it's just slowly releasing more, or not, it's not releasing nitrogen, but it, it's, it's providing food for the soil organisms and they're, Right, so there's there's more material there to get more nitrogen out of over time. Um, so it, yeah, it made me realize that. Yeah, it's it's very true. the The amount of nitrogen available nutrients in compost is actually pretty small, right? Um, and and particularly if you make it yourself, because every time it rains, it washes it out the bottom, right? Same with manure. If a manure is sitting on a pile somewhere, the rain is constantly washing those nutrients away. What we're really adding are these large molecules that in some future date will provide a nitrogen available molecule. Right? And that's really the value of those manures and the compost is that it's a slow feed. They're slowly decomposing. In fact, compost takes five years to decompose in the garden, right? So we talk about finished compost, 
which you know takes six months or and some people think it can be done in two weeks which of course is a myth but that's not finished that's we just think it's finished because we our eyes aren't very good and, and it looks black right but that compost is going to decompose for five years that's beginning compost <laughs> it's beginning compost right. and over that five-year period it's slowly releasing a small amount of nitrate continuously and some of it gets grabbed by the plants and some of it gets washed away and then tomorrow a little bit more will be released and we go through that process and there's enough in there to keep the plants growing right? plants don't want to be surrounded by huge amounts of nitrate Right. We know right. what happens if you do that. You kill the plant, <laughs> right? It's like putting too much fertilizer on your lawn. You kill yeah. the plant if there's too high levels of nitrate. But too high levels of large molecules won't harm the plant. That's fine. You can you can have that sitting around. It's it's the released nitrate that's the problem. Soil pH varies greatly. This is something that's in, you say in the book. Soil pH varies greatly within a given soil ecology. I, I think if you did a soil test and you actually went out and took samples from various areas in your garden, you're probably not going to see a large variation. Okay. But we're looking at this soil on, on a very macro lens, right? We've, we've taken a handful of soil and we said, what's the pH of this? And what we're really doing is asking the question, what is the average pH of everything that's in this handful of soil? Right. right. The organic matter, the microbes, the nitrates, the ammonia, all in, in a clump. What is the average pH? Okay. And that's what we call soil pH. What's interesting is that on a more microscopic level at the root level or where the microbes live or where there's more ammonium and so on, you can have quite different pHs. So one of the most interesting things I think is, is what the plant does in the rhizosphere. The plant actually conditions the pH around the roots. So the pH right next to the roots can be two pH units different than anywhere else in the soil. Right? Okay, and, and when, but just so you, do, when, when you say rhizosphere, you mean the soil that's around the roots of the plant? It's, that... it, it's a, a very, very thin layer around the roots. It's, we're talking uh, like a millimeter layer around the root. Uh, okay, All right. Right. around each, around each, each filament of the root or whatever, yeah. each, each wrong root, term, but. Yeah, each individual root will condition that soil. So the pH there can be dramatically different than everywhere else. And the plants actually condition that pH. Hmm. And this actually makes a lot of sense once you, once you hear that. Because if you look at the nutrients in soil that's slightly alkaline, so my soil is a 7.4. At 7.4, plants should have trouble getting a lot of nutrients. But almost everything grows fine here. Why, why is that? Well, I think the reason is that my soil is 7.4. When I go and measure it, the aggregate of a clump of soil is 7.4, but the pH around the roots could be five, five wow. and a half. Okay. So the roots are growing exactly where they want. They love a pH of 5.5 to six. That's ideal. And that's the pH around the roots. The problem is, as, as gardeners and as, as farmers, we don't have any way to measure that. There, there are scientists who, I don't know how they do it, but they must have tiny, tiny little probes that they, you know, smaller than, than a root hair that they can measure the pH. Um, right. So the pH around that root is different. Okay. Right. The, the pH of, of what we do to the soil also changes. So if I put nitrates, so I'm going to buy some synthetic fertilizer and put some nitrates on my lawn nitrates raise the pH, but it's, it's a temporary thing and it's localized wherever that particle of nitrate fell in the soil, right around it, it suddenly becomes very alkaline. But a few millimeters over where there is no particle of nitrate, it doesn't become alkaline. On the other hand, if I went out and bought my fertilizer and I bought ammonium instead, and so I'm adding the nitrogen through ammonium, ammonium actually acidifies the soil. So if I go on and spread my ammonium synthetic fertilizer, suddenly the pH drops. Hmm. Right? 
But again, that's very localized dropping and it, it will revert back. It's, it's a short-term effect because that ammonium now distributes in the soil and microbes gobble it up and some of it washes away and then we're back to where we were before. Right. So changing the overall pH of soil is actually very difficult. Changing it in a very specific spot for a short period of time can be done. Okay, so uh, next question. We have two more questions here. Uh, one thing I, I didn't really know, I guess it makes sense if you think about it, but uh, you say in the book that all life needs uh, sodium. Uh, how much do plants need? And you never think about, oh, I better get some salt in my garden. Um, it's the last thing you'd want to put in your garden most of the time. So how much do plants need? And um, what's the main reason plants get too much? So plants generally need very little. Um, some plants actually do need more and benefit from more. So things like beets apparently grow better with a higher level of salt. Hmm. In fact, they'll actually grow well in a level that's considered toxic for most plants. Really? But sodium is also very toxic to a lot of plants. So I read something recently where they're still debating this, like how much sodium is good for plants and how much is toxic. And there's certainly evidence that some plants do better in toxic sodium levels than in lower levels, right? So we, we don't understand all of that yet. One of the things that happens with sodium is that as water enters the roots, it takes sodium with it. Okay, so plant roots aren't actively bringing in, so they don't go, I need some sodium, so I'll bring it in. And plant roots do that with some of the nutrients. They actually bring it in when they need it. But sodium kind of flows in with the water. It's passive. Since yeah. our plants need water continuously, if they're growing in an area with high sodium levels, they get a lot of sodium, right? Sodium comes from a variety of places, usually from the soil, uh, around the coast. It comes from sea spray, for instance. There are areas where the natural water that we use for watering our gardens has fairly high sodium levels. Right. And in fact, for, for most gardeners, there's probably more sodium in their drinking water than the plants really need. And that's why you never worry about it. So mm. simply watering your plants once in a while will give them enough sodium. Mm. But drinking water can have sodium in it. There's lots of areas, particularly arid areas where they're using salty water to water their gardens then you can have an excess of sodium, right? Uh, which you have to be very careful with. The sodium, sodium is one of those things that uh, I generally tell people, don't put in your garden. <laughs> your, your, your garden doesn't need it and you may get toxic levels. Now, the good thing about sodium is that it's very soluble. It's kind of like the nitrate and it runs through soil fairly quickly. So in some areas, like around here, we use uh, sodium chloride in the winter to de-ice the roads. And so we have a problem you know, along the edge of our roads where it kills everything because the salt gets too high. Uh, the best way to get rid of that is just with water and, and water will wash it into the soil and, and deeper in the soil so it doesn't affect the plant roots. Um, but a lot of people use sodium chloride to go after weeds and it kills weeds. And I say, well, yeah, it does. It, but it'll kills everything else too. Like it's, it's not weed specific, right? Oh, if it kills a weed, it's probably going to kill everything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> high levels of sodium is, is not good for, for your garden. So keep it in the kitchen. <laughs> in general, it's, it's not an issue for gardeners. We can, we can pretty much ignore it unless you're living in an area that's very salty. And then you have special conditions that you, you have to look into. Right. And I guess the plants in a sense, they're like us in the sense that you know, they don't need, they need sodium, but they, they, they don't need much and they can sort of get it uh, just naturally, just like human beings need salt. Um, but when we, when I, like I made supper this evening, I made a soup and, you know, I, I got the soup going, I gave it a test. I put another teaspoon of salt in that tastes better. I didn't put that extra teaspoon of salt into the soup because we were going to die if I didn't stick it in there. <laughs> um, there was probably enough salts just naturally occurring in the, in the food we were having you know, all the different things, there was some chicken in there, whatever, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't need much. If we don't have it, we, we, 
we start to disintegrate uh, our, our bodies electrochemically are kind of doomed um but uh yeah we well it's it, it's actually an interesting subject i just wrote an article from my blog about pokashi composting and there was a okay yeah 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 people are always telling me i should do it oh you should you should <laughs> the tea from bokashi uh has some nutrients in it and one of the problems is that it has very high sodium chloride levels really and the reason is that all of our food has high levels so a lot of processed food has very high levels right um if you pour some pickling juice in there or some pickles you're adding a huge amount of salt right our yeah, tomato yeah. juices and tomato sauces are all very high sodiums so we actually finding high levels of sodium and chlorine actually in bokashi tea because it comes from the food chlorine well because it's sodium chloride is table salt i see right? so if you add some sodium you're going to add some chlorine too and so our food has too much of both of those and uh, those can actually be toxic. So if you take your Bokashi tea out and don't dilute it enough, you could actually be poisoning your plants. <laughs> now, as far as the need for salt for humans, uh, I used to do a lot of canoeing. And uh, one of the things I did was the Horton River, which was explored by Mr. Horton. And he was going up into the Arctic. This, this was you know, when the first explorers were, were opening up Canada. So it was a long time ago. And he was under the impression that he needed salt. And, but he was going for years. So he wasn't sure what he was going to do. So he went up and decided not to take a lot of salt because the Inuit people at the time didn't have salt. And he found that he went through sort of a two month period of withdrawals. And after that, he was fine. He never had salt for years till he came back to civilization. So the need for salt, I guess, is very low even in our bodies yeah if, if we learn to do without <laughs> yeah i mean you just you, you know you eat a deer you're going to get salt out of that deer yeah. and you know whatever you know the various places trace amounts just seem to be enough mm. but uh boy i you know we i definitely use salt i mean i cook all my food so you're always trying to get the salt levels just right and uh boy it does make your food taste good <laughs> so i don't know what i'd ever do if i had one our condition, I had to lower the amount of salt in my food. I added to everything. I even added to my coffee when I make coffee in the morning. Um, okay, another thing uh, you mentioned in the book, and this one really, I didn't know this. Um, you said that earthrooms need a pH of, of greater than five. Yeah. And that got me thinking like, so if you have earthrooms, does that mean your pH is greater than five? Well, the, the uh, statement, like a canary in the coal mine type. Uh... Uh, yeah, sort of. The, the statement in, in the book is, is perhaps not 100% complete. So most species of earthworms want a pH above five. There are a few that will actually live in more acidic conditions. Okay, yeah. But for the run of the mill earthworms, yeah, if the, if the soil gets too acidic, they will die out. And we really? Will, they actually want a pH closer to neutral, where they're really happy is a pH of seven. And they will grow in a range from five to eight normally, but they prefer somewhere around the seven range. So neutral. Okay. So yeah. So the more, more worms you have in your garden, it's a sign that, you know, your pH is probably somewhere between five and seven. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, it would make sense in a sense because their skin isn't like our, I mean, our, our skin can absorb things, but mainly our skin keeps stuff out. Yeah, you know everything. Uh, you know our our lungs and our mouth absorb. They they, they do the absorbing, but uh, a worm it sucks. Every, you know it it absorbs water through its skin, and it's going to absorb whatever level of acidity is there. Um, so uh, okay, that's interesting to know. All right, great. Well, um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to uh, dis discuss about your book? What's your I guess I'll give, I'll give you an opportunity to sort of pitch your book to people uh, aside from what we've already talked about. But yeah, what, what, you know, what's the main reason you think people should buy this book, read, read this book, or even just get interested in soil science? Let's say, keep it general like that. Well, what I tried to do with the book is I split it into three sections. So section one is sort of what we did tonight. We talked about soil. And it gives you all the background information. It has sections in there about these various microbes and what they do. And, and 
that's sort of the background information so you understand what goes on in the soil. Uh, part two of the book goes through a self-remediation process, right? We might as well use the information we just learned. So the second part goes through a variety of different tests you can do, and they're almost all DIY tests that you can do at home. You don't need any fancy equipment, but you actually go and evaluate the soil that you have today, right? right. So you understand problems and, and it expands a little more. Uh, it looks at, you know, water runoff and compaction and a bunch of other things, not just what's in a scoop of soil. But you try to understand what are your problems? What, where are you now compared to where you could be if you had perfect healthy soil? And then the third section is a self remediation process. So we take the information we know about our own soil and we look to see what can I do to improve the soil and you actually create a plan for yourself and it's a multi-year plan there's nothing in soil happens quickly. Well, that's a good way to say that. Point. There, there are some things you can do to soil quickly, but most things are, are longer term processes. So you come up and you say, okay, I'm going to do these three things this year, solve these problems or start solving them. And then next year, I'm going to do something else. And the next year after that. So you create these plans to improve your soil health. And I think that's one of the things that makes the book unique is that most other books just talk about the soil and then you have to go out and figure out what the heck you're gonna do with that information. Right. I right. wanted to make it very applicable to what a gardener really does. And how do, right. I, how do I improve my garden, which is what most people are asking, right? The soil stuff is interesting, but if I can't know how to use that to make my soil better, then it's just interesting. And right. what we wanna do is actually give you a plan so that five years from now, you look back and say, geez, you know, my soil is much better because I did the right things. Right, right. So, yeah, so so part one, you're sort of giving people the conceptual tools, the language, and the rudimentary scientific understanding of what's going on there so they can understand um, the solutions <laughs> that the rest of the book comes up with. And so you have that part, then you have the sort of diagnosing issues in your soil and, and then solutions. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that is a very good it's a very good book to have, especially if you're concerned that maybe there's a problem with your soil for whatever reason. All right, great. Well, uh, everyone, if you uh, if you enjoy uh, this podcast and uh, the, the guests I'm having and the sort of content we're discussing and you want to help support the channel, check out my two sponsors, uh, Vesti Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Uh, for Vesti Seeds, use my coupon code GAVS21. Um, you get free shipping except oversized items. The, uh, the details are in the description box uh, or the show notes if you're just uh, downloading the podcast. Um, as long as there's a pack of seeds in the order with whatever else you've ordered, unless it's an oversized item, you get free shipping. So you want to buy seven trees and a pack of seeds, free shipping. Good deal. <laughs> it's a good deal, if you're, especially if this is a year where you want to you know, increase things. Um, for um, the Savers Gardening products, there's no coupon code, but you can find their products just about anywhere. You can even find their products at Vessi Seeds. Uh, the three things I used in the past, uh, three things I have experience with is their end all. It's like a general um, pyrethrin, what is it called? S something salts of fatty acids. I can't remember the terminology. Uh, but anyway, it's basically like insecticidal soap plus pyrethrin. Uh, which are, you know, all intent, for all intents and purposes, an organic pesticide <laughs> as, for as much as that term means something to some people. Uh, so I've used that, the end all, I've used the BTK, which is a bacteria that kills caterpillars. And I've used their uh, slug and snail killer, which is a, uh, a slug bait that gives them an overdose of iron and kills them uh, in a probably, a, probably a horrible way to die if you're a slug, but it solves your slug problem. Uh, anyway, those are the safest products I use. You can get them from Vessi Seeds. You can also get them at Walmart, Amazon, you know, the hardware store near where you live. Their stuff's everywhere. If you uh, are concerned about what you're putting into your soil and you're concerned about things being toxic, really that's the, their goal is, to, is to, to provide solutions for gardeners that are going to have a minimal impact on the ecology of your, your soil. Um, so yeah, if you want to help support the channel and they sell something you need, buy it from them. <laughs> uh, Robert, it's been great having you on the show. And of course, we're going to have Robert back again, probably in the fall when it's, uh, you know, 
a lot of people put a lot of time into the soil this time of year, but I would argue fall is the best time to, uh, you know, get your soil ready for the following year. So we're going to have, I'm going to finish reading this book. That's my homework. Um, anyone, if you've got uh, questions, just to, you know, put them in the comment section of this YouTube video, send them to me through my um, uh, podcast channel. Uh, you can put them on my Facebook page and I'll just put them all in one big place. And uh, we can ask Robert some of your questions when we have them on next time as well. So uh, Robert, thanks. Thanks for writing this book. It's a great book. I recommend it to anyone. Uh, you know, it, I don't care how many books you've read on soil, you're probably going to find something new. And it's just well written. It's well put together, I have to say. I really enjoy, re really enjoying reading this book. Um, so Rob, thanks for coming and talking to us. And I can't wait to see you again. It was great. And right. uh, thanks very much for having me. Okay. And I hope you enjoy your time on the throne. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Heavyweights the crowd. Um, all right. So <laughs> everybody, uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. Robert, thanks a lot. Good night, everybody. All right.